It's the highest quality of welcome which Indian tradition always talk about by actually welcoming the guests with Tilak Chandan and now with the token of appreciation. Mr. Karsten Uraman and Professor Valdis Piraks. Vice Chancellor Sharad Padiji welcoming Mr. Karsten Uraman from Germany. And Pro Vice Chancellor Dr. Chinme Pandyaji welcoming Professor Valdis Piraks from Latvia. We welcome both the eminent personalities today and request them to kindly take their respective seats. Today, on the third day of International Festival on <laughs> Yoga, Culture and Spirituality, I would like to welcome you all in this session. Today, we have with us our chairperson of this session, <coughs> respected Pro Vice Chancellor, Dr. Chinmay Pandya, sir. Our Vice Chancellor, sir, uh, Dr. Sharad Parthi, sir. Along with them, our respected speakers, Professor Wallis Pragis and Mr. Karsten Orman. A big round of applause, a welcome applause for them all. Friends, everything is connected. From the past three days of this festival, we have learned about the biology of belief. We have learned about the world peace. We have learned about the theory of meditation over medication. Got the teachings of scientific approach, engaging our life with spirituality. And the knowledge about the microcosmos and microcosmos. Friends, when we connect all these dots together, we find a complete theme, the image of this festival. Now, it's time to set the theme of this session. I would like to introduce to you to a persona who is a real yogi in his life, a complete spiritual person in all his behavior, ambassador of Indian culture and a messenger of Dev Sanskriti. For youths like us, he is a replica of our master's consciousness. First person to come in office and last to leave. Friends, he who emits all happenings of life is actually Yogast. I would not, not take much time. I would like to sincerely like to call and take the honor to call on uh, I would like to call him on dais. Respected Pro Vice Chancellor, Dev Sanskriti Vishwavidyalai, Dr. Chinmay Pandya, sir. A big round of applause for him. Thanks, Pankaj. Allow me to start with the recitation of the Gayatri Mantra. This is our second session of the day. We had a very successful morning session with the yoga this morning. Uh, there was heavy rains and we were thinking that many people may not be able to come. But in spite of that, I think it was a full hall and everyone really enjoyed. So this is the second session of the day, our first session of discursive discussions. Let us start with the Gayatri Mantra. Gayatri, as I said in the day one, comes from two Sanskrit words. Gaya meaning pran, traya meaning tran. Tran means to protect. The power that protects the prana is called Gayatri. And the mantra is dedicated to Bhagwan Surya, dedicated to feminine power of sun. So let us hope, pray, wish that with each word, vibration of each and every single shabd of this mantra, the energy of the rising sun is flowing through us. Gayatri mantra together. Om Bhur Bhuvah 
subtle presence of Pooja Gurudev and Vandaniya Mataji. Let me start by introducing those who are seated on the dais. Our respected, most uh, elder, senior and sincere member of our organization, Vice Chancellor Shishat Pardiji. He had been associated with Kaitri Parivar for last 35 years. Second generation, uh, his father was also part of the Gayatri Parivar, been with Gurudev since 1940s. And his son is also part of the Gayatri Parivar. And they come from a family of architects. All the things that you see in this campus uh, is actually designed by Sharad Pardhiji. So uh, great respect to him. Then we have got a very dear member of our family, Karsten uh, from Mannheim, Germany, if I spelled it correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he is also a very dear member of the family, a very uh, famous person in his own faculty and own, own field, he comes from a, a discipline of leadership. And as I discussed yesterday, in that in Bhagavad Gita, when Bhagavan Sri Krishna is defining yoga, he is saying, yoga karmasu kaushalam. Yoga is the excellence of all actions. And that's why we have got people with so diverse background on the dais. We have got an architect sitting, then we have got an engineer sitting, who is not working in the field of engineering, but in working in the field of creating leaders for tomorrow. Karsten O'Harman from Germany. Then we have got a very special, precious personality with us, Professor Pirag from Latvia. He is the head of the Medical Council of Latvia, an endocrinologist by profession, but have got such deep-rooted understanding of Indian culture that he is also part of the Center for Indic Studies in Latvia and the part of the University of Latvia. Uh, as you can see from his attire and appearance also, uh, he is more Indian than most of us. So a warm welcome to <laughs> Professor Pirag also. Now, setting up the theme for today's discussion. Um, I would like to start by sharing a beautiful story of the Upanishads with you. A story comes in the Upanishad and it comes in three Upanishads. I don't know which one to choose, but uh, a story is very beautiful. The story is of a young man called Shwet Ketu. Shwet Ketu was the son of a great sage, Aruni. And Shwet Ketu was a very talented young man. Very, very talented young man. Extraordinary. So he was sent to Varanasi to study Vedas. He was sent to Varanasi to do Adhyan. And he returned home at the tender age of 14. And he knew everything about the Vedas. He knew everything about the knowledge. And he accumulated all the information that he possibly could. And when he returned home, he was full of ego. He was full of pride for himself. He thought he knew everything. His father thought that his son needed to be taught a lesson of the life. That it's not only about the knowledge. It's about following the wisdom. It's not only about accumulating the information that anyone can do with the help of Google and Wikipedia. But that does not make you master. So he called him and he said that, son, now you know everything about Vedas, you know everything about Lord, you know everything about Bhagwan, you know everything about divine, but have you really felt the presence of divine? Do you have any experience of divine? And although Shwet Ketu was a man of pride, he was also a man of integrity. He was also a man of honesty. He said very honestly to his father that, yeah, I can cite every verse of Ved, I can cite every verse of ancient scriptures, but in full honesty, I have got no understanding. I don't know. I never experienced Bhagwan. I never experienced Lord. I never experienced divinity. I have got no idea. So Aruni said, do you want to feel it? And Shwet Ketu said, yes, I, I definitely would. So he got a glass of water and he got some sugar cubes. Then he took the sugar cubes and mixed them the water. Shakkarli pani me miladi. And then he asked to his son, where is the sugar now? And Shwet Ketu said, actually it is inside the water. I saw it happening in front of me, but I don't know where it is. He said, how would you know that it is inside the water? And Shwet Ketu said, I would taste the water. Then I would know. The sweetness of the water would tell me 
दैट द शुगर इज़ इन साइड मैं चख करके देखूँगा तो पता चलेगा कि पानी मीठा है उससे पता चलेगा कि अंदर शक्कर है आर ओनी सेट सेम विद द डिवाइन डिवाइन इज एवरी सेकेंड एवरी एटम ऑफ दिस प्लेनेट इट्स ऑल अराउंड अस इट्स जेल्ड अराउंड अस लाइक वायु लाइक एयर इट इज़ आउट साइड अस लाइक एयर इट इज़ इन साइड अस लाइक प्राण नाइदर वी कैन सी द वायु एयर नॉर वी कैन सी द प्राण बट वी नो इट इज देयर डिवाइन इज ऑल अराउंड अस बट इफ यू वॉन्ट टू फील इट देन यू हैव टू एक्सपीरियंस इट इट्स ए साइंस ऑफ एक्सपीरियंस नॉट ए साइंस ऑफ एक्सप्रेशन He said, "It's not about talking about things. It's not about giving information. It's about feeling it. It's about perceiving it. It's about sensing it, and realizing that divine consciousness is inseparable, and we are part of one and unified consciousness." Shweta Ketu famously uttered, "Aham Brahmasme, Aham Brahmasme. I am that divine. There is no other divine. I am part of the same consciousness, and that consciousness in every single cell of this planet." that consciousness is inseparable that consciousness is beyond caste creed culture geographical boundaries that is everywhere and that is the message of yoga the message of the yoga that we are part of the same consciousness and that consciousness cannot be broken that cannot consciousness cannot be separated and the original ego the original sin that we have created is by believing that i is different than the divine moment i had i moment i had ego i have to do something to satisfy my ego i need power i need position i need money i need prosperity i need relationships to satisfy ego imagine for a second that you do not exist close your eye and think that you do not exist there is no expectation there is no aspirations there is no desire there is no fight there is no strife there is no struggle there is nothing it's all prevalent consciousness and that is the message of the yoga yoga teaches us that we have to have the inner harmony we have to have the inner balance we have to have this contentment inside without that all other pursuits are useless we can try to satisfy it by any mean but it's like trying to satisfy the fire with the ahutis you cannot do it you can only aggravate it you put more ghee inside you put more uh, inflammable things inside and you only going to aggravate the fire so people think that if i can satisfy my this desire then maybe i would be satisfied it's not like that it's just going to give you another desire to chase for and that is why the message of the yoga is the having harmony inside i shall share another small story with you before introducing our uh, speakers on the dais and the reason i am giving this understanding so that we can relate to what they are going to talk about because they're going to talk about two diverse things they're going to talk about two different ideologies they're going to talk about two different philosophies but it does not mean that we are talking about two different things it only means that we are trying to find the link bridge interconnection between these two different themes the another story that i would share with you is the story of prince shrotra shrotra was a prince at the time of lord buddha and he was a so rich and spoiled prince that people say that he had a seven story mansion all made up of gold and when he heard the discourse of lord buddh he became a monk after becoming a monk his life changed absolutely to the other side so everyone would walk on the normal path and he would walk in the bushes everyone would eat the normal food he would not eat for months and days so his health started to decline pura sharir uska khatam hone laga bhook khatam ho gayi sharir ki jo hai swasthya bigadne laga lord buddh came to see him lord buddh said that shrotra before you became a prince you were also a good player of veena veena is like indian guitar so he said you were also a good player of veena and shrotra said yes lord i was he said if the strings of the veena are too tight what would happen shrotra said that bhagwan music won't come there would be no music and he said if the strings are too loose bahut dheele hain taar to kya hoga he said music won't come either lord buddh said to have music in the instrument to have music in the veena it needs to be adequately balanced it should be genuinely balanced it should be perfectly balanced and same is with the life you cannot tight it too much you cannot loose it too much it should not be either on this spectrum it should not be on that spectrum you should try to find the harmony inside you should try to find balance inside and moment you have got the balance inside everything else becomes absolutely adequately poised and that is the reason why we have got these sessions 
The reason of these sessions is to learn from the experience of all these great souls, from their life's experience, from their area of expertise, but then to use that knowledge to find the balance inside. Then use that knowledge to find what really means to you, what can make your life meaningful, what can make your life more productive, what can make your life more with a beauty, with a music, with a balance inside. And that is why we have got speakers from two neighboring countries, or not really neighboring countries, but close, close countries, and with the two areas of expertise that I'm sure that everyone here would really love to listen. So I would like to invite uh, Karsten or Harman from Manaheim first. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I am sure in this journey, when we look at ourselves, we find ours. The good part is that we are all Shwet Ketus in some or the other way. We have started our journey, and some of us have already realized the, the masters who have been here since day before are those realized ones who have actually tasted the sweet water. And we are the ones who are witnessing the mixing of water and sugar within. So it's good that we uh, sab milke ye satya dekh pa rahe hain ki adhyatma ek jeeta jaagta shashwat satya hai aur hum mein se jo hamare seniors hain wo use jee ke bhi bata rahe hain to hum log uski prayas kar pate hain ki kaise use apne jeevan mein utare bahut bahut dhanyawad adarniya chinmay sir ka and now mr kasten oraman will enlighten us on a very wonderful theme as we have been listening that he comes from an engineering background and uh, Sir is actually helping excel in leadership, helping companies across the globe, you know, companies which are as big as with 40,000 plus employees, and he has been on the board of various such organizations, and helping them, hand-holding them, how they can excel in their practices on a spiritual base, which is actually a very big area, because so many countries are actually as big as a company's turnover. So when you really see the GDP of a country and compare it with the turnover of a company, you find that it is as good as, a, as an economy. So it's a wonderful task that if we can inject these spiritual values and change their mindset, we can really bring a change as good as of the magnitude of a whole nation. I request without wasting any time, Mr. Karsten Oroman from Germany to kindly take the dais and bless us. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Karsten Oroman. Very good morning. I'm really pleased to be here, and thank you very much, my dear friend Chinmay, for this opportunity to speak to you today. I would want to start with showing you this picture over there. I hope that you can see it as well. And I have a question to you. Wouldn't you agree that our Mother Earth is a beautiful planet? Just show your hands. It's a beautiful planet, isn't it? Yes, it is a beautiful planet. There is an interesting thing if you ask young children in Europe, in Germany, particularly young boys, what they want to be in the future, what is their profession. A lot of them say, I want to be an astronaut. I don't know whether it's the same over here. But a lot of people, a lot of young kids want to be astronauts. And actually there is something which I want to point out. We are all astronauts. And this is our spaceship. And I'd like to extend my welcome to obviously all my friends, family members here, but in particular, those who humbly sit at the back of the audience. Actually, I think you should sit in the front. The reason why I think you should sit in the front is because you, all of you, are going to be the future leaders of this spaceship. So I bow to you. What I want to talk to today about is how 
we can apply scientific spirituality in business to create a better life for ourselves, a better business, and a better world. But before I do this, let me just briefly tell you something about my background. Um, Jimmy has already mentioned I'm from Germany. I'm just, I haven't met anyone. Is anyone else from Germany here? Okay. Um, then it's worth just sharing some of the information about typical Germans. Um, it is said that all Germans are engineers because we produce cars like BMW and Mercedes and all of this, so all of us are engineers. We are all very structured and very analytical guys and we are all very successful in business. And there is one thing which uh, is also very true, Germans don't have any humor. So just to, just to relate myself to this, uh, Carsten Norman, as, as has been said, it has been mentioned that I'm a mechanical engineer by education, so I'm indeed an engineer. I'm indeed very structured. And I have been pretty blessed to be very successful in business. So I have been a board member of a 40,000 employees company with a, a turnover of around uh, 3 billion uh, British pounds. Don't know what this is in, in US, but it's probably around 4.5. Uh, billion, um, and, uh, but I've, I've stopped that basically. And the reason why I've stopped that is because I regard myself as a philosopher, not as a philosopher like Plato and Aristotle, but as a philosopher in its true meaning, as a lover of wisdom. And I turned out to study sustainable business at Cambridge University, and that is the reason why I actually learned to appreciate the world and I also became a psychological advisor, and I'm acting as an executive coach, so working with senior management, and I'm the founder of the CXO Evolution Academy, and I'm going to talk to you about this in a, in a short moment. So people in back where I'm coming from ask me, okay, this international festival of culture, yoga, and spirituality, what is this about? And I say, yeah, it's, it's international, so it's people from all over the world. But then they think, okay, it's yoga. And yoga for us in the Western world means hatha yoga, right? It's just sort of strange asanas, and this is, this is what people think, particularly in my background. They think this is yoga. And some people who have been thinking about this a little bit further, they might even think that yoga is, is meditation. So they combine this sort of my background. They think, okay, this guy is going to, going to sit there and going to meditate somewhere with, with a group of others. Um, and honestly, uh, I hope that I still earn the right to be here, but uh, I need to confess that I'm not meditating. So um, I will certainly, certainly think about this in the future. But the interesting thing that I want to talk about today is we have already combined the field of science with spirituality. And what I would want to bring now is I would want to bring the third dimension to this. We are living in a three-dimensional world. So the third dimension to this is the business and the business in a way, as a way to communicate and to bring all of this scientific spirituality into the world as a lever, if you wish. So the question is, why didn't it work so far? And I'm absolutely convinced that it is a matter of language. It's a matter of we don't really understand each other. We have got a world of science, we've got a world of spirituality, we have got a business world, and they all are separate. In the business world, we talk about silos. So we have a silo here, a silo there, and a silo there. They are not matching, they are not talking to each other. So what we need from my point of view is we need to be able to speak the same language. It is about understanding each other. And that is the most important thing. So the question is now, how do you actually speak to business leaders? Business leaders are often regarded as sort of very senior people and really um, to be honored and so on and so on. But let me tell you, you should speak to business leaders as you would speak to your child. So draw pictures. You need to draw simple pictures because that is what people understand. And this is irrespective of the language. So what you have is draw pictures and explain the world by drawing pictures because that takes away a lot of the difficulties that terminology actually imposes on us. So by drawing these pictures, I explain to the business leaders how our world actually really works. And this is how it works. You have one person, you have another person, you have some animals, you have some plants. This is nature, basically. And we all perceive this as being separate because particularly in, in, in my background, 
we have all been taught that that is the physical realm and that is, that is what we are living and what we are perceiving. But the interesting thing then is to actually tell them, mm, why? why couldn't the world look like that? Why is there not something beyond your level of perception which is non-physical, which is non-material, which actually combines everything? So by just drawing a very simple picture, you convey the concept of duality versus the absolute realm. And this is another interesting thing because it, here it says physical versus non-physical. But there are different terminologies. You could call it physical or the psychic or mental and the subtle or, and, and material and the spiritual and natural and supernatural and science and pseudoscience. You, you see what I get. This, this borderline does exist, but people call it in a different way. Body-mind, matter and mind, and also the, the, the source below is, has different uh, words, basically. So it is, called, um, it is called information field, or it is called source field. Some physicists call it the, the zero point field. Um, some indigenous cultures call it the akasha, um, or as some of the psychologists actually called it, the collective unconsciousness. Um, and actually, some people call it oneness, and I know that we have got many, many, many of these terms. And if I would spend more time with you, I think I, I, could, I could add thousands of these terms. Um, but I think you, you see my point, right? It's, it's, it's simplicity. It's not that difficult to connect these people just by understanding that we are using terminology and whilst the terms might differ, we are actually talking about the same thing. So the term that we are using at the CXO Evolution Academy is the term oneness. This is just something which we have chosen. This is something which actually is acceptable for people of my tribe, as I call it, right? For business people. Because believe me, if I would go into a boardroom and talk to senior executives and would start to talk about spirituality and God, I'd be kicked out within 30 seconds. It's just the case. So when we talk about, when we talk about oneness, um, we make a distinction here because we distinguish between an emotional perception of oneness and a cognitive perception of oneness. So the emotional perception of, co of, uh, of oneness is what's happening in your heart. And the cognitive perception of oneness is what's happening in your mind. It's the rational aspect of it. So if you then sort of try to understand what this basically means, you have different groups of people. You have got the Spiritual people. I would, I would assume a lot of you are very spiritual people. So you know inside your heart that there is this connectedness, right? This is what you feel. You know this oneness. You feel it on an emotional basis. And then there is this other group of people, and we have been talking, or my, my dear friend from Portugal yesterday has mentioned that there are a lot of scientists. Um, it, it dates back to the early 19, uh, 20th century, so 1920s, 1930s, when quantum physics basically came about. And, uh, and that, that triggered a lot of understanding on, on the real, true reality of, of what we experience. So there are scientists who actually understand, scientifically prove and understand that this is all one, right? but they just get it here in their head, right? They just, they just look at this an, from an analytical basis. And then there is this group, this is a very, very interesting group. And this is the group which we should strive for because this is the group of people who combine an emotional attachment to oneness with a rational attachment to oneness. And I just happen to call them idealist. I'm borrowing this term from uh, a colleague of mine, another philosopher called Plato. Um, and uh, he, has been, he has been talking about this idealistic idea, which means everything has a source in, in a non-physical way, in an idea. That's the reason why we, why we talk about an idealistic worldview here. But opposing the idealistic worldview, there is then this, what we call a materialistic worldview. And I think you all understand what this means. A materialistic worldview means people have got neither an emotional attachment to oneness nor an, an analytical or a cognitive understanding of oneness. So, what's happening with the different communities? If you just look at different communities, I mean, I'm, I'm wearing this suit because I represent 
global business, right? We have spiritual people who wear different dresses because they represent a spiritual community. And we, have, we are just different communities. So if we look at how many people, how is the distribution of these roles in these various communities? I've just taken the freedom to take the Shanti Kunj as an example, and don't, don't really quote those figures. This is just to illustrate something. But most of the people in the Shanti Kunj would be spiritual people. I, I made it 80% here. The reason why I made it 80% is because there's, I think there, is also, there are also people who understand it from a, from a cognitive point of view as well. So this is the 15%. And there are probably people who join. So these are the, the lower numbers down there. So this is just to, to illustrate really where people are. If you look at my tribe, you find that almost all of us are really, really deeply rooted materialists. And um, sadly, there is almost none. I mean, it's, I'm, not, I'm not saying none, and we have a dear friend here, uh, Forrest, who is, uh, who is certainly representing a, a leader who uh, certainly fits into this category. But the, the challenge really is, it's just a few people so far. And then we have another group, which is the scientists. And so the scientists actually have a materialistic worldview as well. And you would think, well, what's going on there? Why don't, why don't they have a scientific sort of attitude? And I'll tell you something. This changes immediately as soon as the scientists retire. So what happens when the scientists retire is that they actually admit that there is an underlying oneness, something which they can't admit because they are afraid to risk their career. This is, in, this is really important to understand. So it's not just your internal mindset, it's also your environment which actually allows people to be who they are or not to be who they are. So the question really is, what makes all of the difference? And from my perspective, it is an educational background and it is an experience. All of you have been brought up in an environment where spirituality is really, really important. So you have been, from the very first moments, you have been actually educated in this way and you experience it this, in this way. And the other thing, just to illustrate the example of the scientists, is social conditioning. So we are, we are part of our community and our community imposes something on you, right? And this is interesting to understand. So the real, the real challenge here is to see that we are all a result of our environment, basically. And the fact that we have got communities who are very spiritual, and the fact that we have got communities who are very materialistic, and the fact that we have got communities who are very, very scientifically oriented, means one thing. If we change the education, transformation can happen. So things can change. Think about this, because most of you have been brought up and you are just part of one of these silos, but think about the flexibility. Things can change, right? So if we look at how things can change, we basically talk about three different ways how things can change. And we, we take the extremes from the materialistic starting point. So someone who is neither emotionally attached to oneness nor cognitively attached to, to oneness. So what can happen is what I call the spiritual path. People who actually really first become spiritual and then learn more about the, the scientific background, if you wish. We have a lot of people who actually have near-death experiences, who have really out-of-body experiences, all, a lot of things. So these things can happen. The other path is basically what I call the scientific path. And I have to admit, I'm a representative of this scientific path. I mean, being a mechanical engineer, I was never a spiritual person, never believe me, and I, I actually look at evidence. And what has happened over the last two decades, basically, is I have taken evidence pieces bit by bit by bit by bit, and I actually departed from a materialistic worldview and I arrived in an idealistic worldview. So this is, this is what's happening on the scientific path, and then there is this direct path, and I really, really admire what you do over here, because what you do is you combine this, right? Particularly this university combines the spiritual aspect as well as the scientific aspect. And that is the a deep, a deep up, right? You, you, guys, you guys lead the direct way, right? That's perfect. So what, does this, what, what is 
what does it actually mean if this transformation is then complete? I just get back to this picture and the question really is, what does it do to your own perception of your own identity? If you ask the question, if you ask yourself the question, who am I? And think about this question, who am I? And now think about this question from a materialistic point of view, who am I? A materialist would see himself there. He occupies a body, he is a separate entity, he is one ego. If you now look at what an idealist would think about, he would himself see being part of this big oneness. So there is a shift. There is a shift in identity when you shift from a materialistic worldview to an idealistic worldview. So let's talk about what is the impact of this shift. And I'm using, uh, you find me using a lot of scientific models basically, so nothing has been invented by myself, but there is a, there is a model which is uh, coming from the uh, NLP, the Neuro Linguistic Programming Background, and it's uh, compiled by uh, Robert Dills. And I'm just using a simplified model here. But it shows basically that the identity has an impact on our values and beliefs. What we think of who we are has an impact of, on our values and beliefs. And that has an impact on our behavior. Our values and beliefs drive our behavior. And our behavior has an impact on our personal environment. So the, the question really is, what is the basis of everything? And in a materialistic worldview, the basis of everything is considered to be matter, material stuff, right? And that has an implication, because if matter is the basis of everything, our identity means we are separate beings. Separateness is our identity. And this identity then leads to values and beliefs which are actually egocentric. We care about ourselves. And that means that in our interaction, we aim to compete and win. And that leads to really, really difficult life situations. So if you now swap around and go to the other side, in an idealistic worldview, we talk about a, a single information field. And again, there, is a, there are different terminologies for this, but I, I use terminology which is acceptable for business leaders. So this is a single information field. And this single information field does one thing. It changes your identity. It changes your identity to oneness. And this oneness is then fostering and, and, and facilitating values of connectedness, which lead to a collaboration and care, which ultimately lead to a better life. But we can even take this further. Because there is another dimension in business. And we face difficult situations in business. And actually the same shift can change also our business. So it can lead to a better business as well. And it cannot only lead to a better life and a better business. No, it can actually also have an impact on our society and ultimately on our nature. And this is the reason why I showed you Mother Earth at the beginning. So it is something where we can turn a very difficult world into a very, very much better world. So what you actually see is that this transformation, this transformation from a very materialistic worldview to a very idealistic worldview, that is something which we call the evolution of consciousness, can lead to a better life, a better business, and a better world. And this is exactly the reason why I have given up my executive role and a board, as a board member in, in, a, in a huge company, because when I understood that, I recognized that I cannot continue spending my time on increasing the shareholder value on only one single company. If we can contribute to that. So because of that, I've basically founded the CXO Evolution Academy. So what does this actually mean, CXO Evolution Academy? Again, it might sound, why CXO and what, what does it all mean? It's basically, again, a matter of terminology. CXOs in my culture, in my background, means senior business leaders. And I explain why the, where this comes from. If you look at, a, at an organizational hierarchy, basically, you have got all of the different management levels. You've got the executive board, and then you've got the lower management level, and then you've got the employees. And the top level group, the executives, are basically called chief executive officer, chief finance officer, chief operation officer. So all of these C blah 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 O, right? So C placeholder O, 
CXO. So that is that is how we basically came to this uh, to this uh, to this acronym. The other thing is that I am Carsten Orman, CO, and um, so this is this was just. This was just the other sort of funny thing around that. So that explains the CXO. Let me explain the evolution. I really mean the evolution of consciousness, right? I'm not immediately tell people this when I'm, when I'm talking to business people about this. So the CXO evolution um, is basically an academy for senior business leaders to evolve their, their individual consciousness. So why actually do we concentrate on business leaders? Well. Business leaders actually, if you think about this, benefit from this most. Why do they do this? Because business leaders are individual people. They will benefit, they will have a better life if they basically turn to, a, to an idealistic worldview. But they also are in charge of a business, so they enjoy the better business itself, right? Perfect. And if you think about business leaders of huge organizations, they have a moral obligation and an ethical obligation to also do something, do something good for the, uh, for the community. So they basically care about the world as well. So business leaders are a perfect target group because they get a better life for themselves, a better business for themselves, and a better world. The other, the other reason why we are focusing on business leaders is what I call the multiplication effect. And that is about how we spread the news. The average person basically, and again, figures might be wrong, but the average person might influence his environment. If you, if you turn to be a different being, you can influence your environment. But you have a limited reach, right? Probably you've got 10 people, I don't know. So it's your family members or whatever. But if you think about a business leader, there is a broad range. And I know Forrest, you, you have got a company of around 100 people, I think. Um, yeah, and, uh, and this is just, this is just one, one size of the company, but there are much bigger companies. I mean, the company I was a board member of, we had 40,000 employees when I left, right? And just think about this, because if you have, if you, if you are, and particularly you guys who are going to be the future leaders, if you are a business leader, your reach, your, oops, your spread is tremendous. You can reach people. There is one group of people who actually can even reach more. And I think the Indian Prime Minister has just given a, prim, uh, a prime example of, uh, of declaring this, uh, this cleanness campaign over here. But he is still a rare exception to the rule, right? Because the politicians usually just follow the majority of the population. So if you, if you look at that, they are, they are hardly going to be drivers. Unless they are really sort of self-aware, they might drive something. But usually they are not drivers, they are just followers. And it's an interesting thing because as soon as the majority of the people belief in, a, in, a, in an idealistic worldview, the politicians will, will kick in at some point, right? And then everything will change immediately. And the last reason is basically my personal background, and it's, it has something to do with this language thing, right? We need to speak the right language. So it's, it's a combination of these three things which actually led me to, to, uh, to set up this academy. And uh, it's all driven about my, my approach to, to uh, create an efficient transformation from this materialistic to this idealistic worldview. So let me just briefly talk about what the academy really does. The academy has got three streams. The first stream is an educational stream. And what it talks about is, what is this idealistic worldview? Again, I remind you, idealistic worldview is nothing else than what is spirituality, right? But what is this idealistic worldview? It talks about what is the scientific evidence. It addresses the cognitive dimension of this movement. Because particularly in the Western world, people are very much receptive to a cognitive understanding, far more than to a spiritual understanding. So we need to, we need to address this. And it shows what is the impact, what will happen once we move towards this idealistic worldview. The second stream that, that we have at the university is a coaching stream. Those business leaders who embark on this journey, who start the journey, those business leaders will go through a personal transformational change process. And we help them with that. We take them by the hand. We have got experienced coaches who really understand this, who are living in the materialistic world as well as in this idealistic world, who can guide them. And that is very important for, for people. It, and it is not at least important because people feel lonely on this process, particularly people from my background. You can be really lonely because everyone around you is a materialist. It's a hardcore materialist, right? And you feel, ooh, 
there is something going on. So you need, you need someone to support you. And also to, in order to, to avoid this loneliness, what we do is, the third stream is we connect people. We connect like-minded people. So all of these business leaders who actually join us get the opportunity to speak and meet, to meet others, like-minded people. So in a nutshell, what we do is we educate, we coach, and we connect. And we do this for a better life, a better business, and a better world. That sounds all great, but now comes the difficult piece. Our mission actually needs your help. And the reason why we need your help is open-minded business leaders are like needles in a haystack. I hope that translates. So there are only a very, very, very small, but there's only a very small number of open-minded business leaders at that very moment, right? And it is difficult to find these, right? We are talking about far less than a percent. <laughs> it's difficult to find these. So it's an open plea, basically. Please help us searching for these needles, right? So if you know one, get us connected, please. The other thing is, if you know about an opportunity where we can speak, where we can spread the news, let us know. Right? We are looking for, for audience, we look for reach. We want to speak at conferences like those, also business conferences. We want to speak media, press, and so on. We, we try to create a reach here. And then, just to conclude this, and this is my, my German background. I mean, looking for needles in the haystack is not the appropriate approach for an engineer, right? We wouldn't do that. We would think about an, a very, very sophisticated method on how to do this. And I would want to propose a German engineering solution. And when I looked at this word, solution, something strange happened to me. Because I had this association, a solution is soul lotion. It's lotion for your soul. And it would be certainly lotion for my soul. It would be certainly lotion to, to my soul and for my soul if I can relate to what you, my dear friend Shinmei, uh, always refer to, and that is this family idea that you create. So my solution that I would want to propose to all of you is, let our family be a huge magnet on top of this haystack in order to pull out all of the needles. Namaskar. I think it deserves a little more warmer. Thank you. Thanks, thanks one and all. I'm sure it made absolute sense to one and all present here, especially to uh, we all who have been, you know, l being on a journey of learning things, our students especially, whom Mr. Carsten was always referring to the future leaders, that how things can make impact. Kaise hum apne jeevan mein ऐसी चीज़ें कर सकते हैं कि आने वाला भविष्य जब हम बनाएं तो इन चीज़ों को कितने व्यवस्थित तरीके से हमने अभी देखा पूरी प्रेजेंटेशन में कि उन्होंने वैल्यू सिस्टम से लेकर बिलीफ सिस्टम से लेकर कैसे एक आइडियलिस्टिक जीवन को जिया जा सकता है कैसे मटेरियलिस्टिक से आइडियलिस्टिक तक पहुँचा जा सकता है ये रास्ता हमें दिखाया मिस्टर कास्टन श्री औरविंदो वन ऑफ द वेरी फेमस इंडियन सेंट्स यूज टू से दैट द इवोल्यूशन ऑफ बॉडी अकॉर्डिंग टू डार्विन हेज ऑलरेडी हैपन्ड but now is the time for evolution of consciousness. And we congratulate you that CXO is actually working on evoluting, evolutionizing the consciousness of people. And uh, we are really thankful that you have come all the way from Germany and shared this wonderful piece of information with us, which is, which is our Gurudev's word. We could feel there is a connect. That connect is already there. Gurudev used to say, I am a big magnet who actually roam up. And if there is anyone having that magnetic property, that needle is hiding somewhere in the haystack, it comes out and gets cut. So that was a perfect, perfect connect with Gurudev's vision of Karsten Uramanji. Moving on next, friends. As we all know, when we talk about yoga, we always say we need to integrate our body, mind, and soul. But when we begin, we found it that the combining of these three, we found it very much difficult. Our next speaker 
is presenting his topic on the same. He will focus upon, he will focus the light and upon the topic, integrating body, mind and soul. He is a medical expert all the way from Latvia. Put your hands together to welcome on dais Professor Waldis Pegaras. Good morning, uh, respectful sirs and uh, dear friends and colleagues. I have principally the same task, but instead of the business world, I have to speak about the medical world, how to transform the medical world. I'm speaking about the bioscience to more idealistic level, to the more spiritual level, more conscious level, and uh, we call it in our terminology integrative medicine, or probably better term will be uh, integrative health, science about uh, integrative health. And uh, principally, I want to answer two questions today. How to integrate uh, the science of body, mind, and spirit, and how to translate it uh, to the language of the Western science. My background is uh, endocrinology, and endocrinology, as you know, is the science of uh, the internal regulation of the human uh, uh, metabolism and uh, health processes uh, via hormones. But the understanding what is the hormone is, is really uh, widening nowadays. It's not just uh, simple insulin or uh, glucocorticoids. It's, it's principally known now that every cell in our organism is secreting, is producing hormones, and every cell is able to react to the hormones. And uh, there is a big uh, similarity to the human world because all of us are like uh, cells in one big body and uh, we are able to secrete our hormones and uh, to react to them because we have those receptors. The problem is that not always the receptors are expressed. In scientific uh, language we sell, uh, say it, uh, cells are not expressing, however, they have the information about the receptors in their genes, genetic information. So how to open our cells, our minds actually, to this uh, new information. And uh, this is not an easy task. And uh, I'm coming from a very classical university. And uh, uh, the best greetings from uh, our rector, uh, Dr. Martis Ausinch, and uh, you see we have, uh, first of all, the Center of Indian Studies and Culture <laughs> recently opened, and uh, Professor Sigma Ankrava on the, on the right is uh, acting director of this center, and we have an uh, uh, agreement of uh, mutual understanding between our universities. So uh, I see that the, the future should be bright. And uh, my task today is uh, to show our approach, um, how we see uh, what is the best tool how to integrate medicine, biomedicine, and, uh, and medicine on uh, body, mind, and spirit in one, one onus. So this is a very classical picture, how we are using the so-called Euler rings to show uh, different, uh, differ different branches in medicine. And uh, you see uh, the so-called allopathic or Western medicine is only part of, of the, whole, the whole. And then uh, in uh, in India, we have a traditional medicine which is called Ayurveda or Ayurveda. 
and alternative, alternative, alternative treatments. And uh, in, uh, practically in every uh, cult, medical society in different parts of the world, we have different traditions which are called alternative or complementary. And uh, if we unite those two parts, the biomedical part and, uh, and the traditional part, then we get uh, the complementary medicine, but it's still not the whole medicine. The whole medicine is when we integrate it in one, in one whole body, one whole um, phenomenon, and that we call integrative medicine. Could you go one, one slide back, please? Two, two slides back? Yes. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, how the Western uh, science and uh, tradition understands currently what is the, in, what is the integration of, uh, of different parts of, of medicine. And uh, it's re recognized that the cornerstones of wellness are good nutrition, good hydration, good uh, exercise, and uh, restorative sleep and rest. Those are basic cornerstones. On that, we, we have also so-called foundations of opt optimal health, which includes uh, weight management, stress management, spiritual and uh, emotional wellness social relationships and intimacy, intimacy. On top of this, we have uh, integrative medical therapies, which includes uh, nutritional supplements, structural uh, augmentation, and uh, gastrointestinal health, and el energy medicine. On the other side, uh, we should treat infections and prevent them. We, would, we should keep a natural hormone balance. We should uh, optimize our neurotransmission, uh, neuron transmission, uh, secretion, and uh, reception of them. And uh, we should care about detoxification if needed. And uh, the final goal is to reach this mind, uh, body, and spirit oneness. However, in, uh, in critical conditions, especially, and everybody uh, unfortunately is facing such critical conditions in our life, we will need uh, some uh, in drug intervention, un drug inter intervention, and uh, ultimately also surgical procedures, including, uh, for, for example, heart artery stenting, And Western medicine, Western business-oriented medicine, unfortunately is uh, oriented only on, on the, these small segments, all, these, all segments on the top of, of the pyramid. And uh, it's quite clear that uh, the main corpus of the pyramid of the health is uh, largely in, ignored. However, the situation is changing. Next slide, please. And I think many good ideas to the West are coming from a traditional Indian approach to, to the health, uh, from Ayurved. And uh, I think this uh, is one of the best uh, approaches uh, which are um, you, you can read this book if you, if you find it. In, uh, and this is uh, the book written by Professor Ramharsh Singh from the Banaras Hindu University. And it, uh, it has six, 65 chapters. And uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not going today through all chapters, but um, only uh, the sections, five sections, Ayurvedic medicine and its quantum logic, 
nature cure and uh, biopurification, yoga physiology, yoga therapy, and para, uh, para psychology and occult experiences. And uh, you should agree that for a normal Western bioscientist, it is very difficult, especially the, the last um, sections, to understand what is the real the, uh, materialistic uh, background of it. And uh, the problem is in, in Western science is that we are using the, the old principle that uh, what is not measurable, uh, measurable doesn't exist. Next slide, please. And uh, my aspiration, my deep um, uh, vision is that uh, we need a new type of uh, textbook for uh, students. And this textbook is mainly for the Western students, but I now that also in India you have the same uh, split between uh, so-called allopathic medicine and uh, Ayurvedic medicine. So it will be very useful, I hope, also for uh, Indian students. And this proposed textbook will have an innovative approach to compare evidence-based uh, conventional or Western medicine to authentic evidence because uh, experience from 1,000 years of uh, Indian medical culture is, uh, I think, also some kind of evidence-based Ayurveda. Next slide. And as a prototype of it, the prototype to my idea was uh, the interesting story how French um, scientist Jean-Francois Champollion he, back in 1822 translated uh, Egyptian text into the modern language. Be before that, actually uh, those Indian, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> I was thinking about Indian, but was, uh, I should say Egyptian. Those Egyptian texts, which, were, which are also many thousands, uh, thousand years old, were considered just a, a series of, of some b birds, uh, hands, and you know, uh, symbols which are not understandable for us, the modern people. Fortunately, there was a, a stone, a stone uh, which is called uh, Rosetta Stone, which had uh, on the same stone two texts. One was in this ununderstandable Egyptian language, and another was in understandable Greek language. And uh, Dr. Champollion was so, so uh, good in understanding uh, how to translate it, that he, he did it. And now we are able to understand those old inscriptions in the temples of Egypt. Next one. And this picture is very interesting because it shows uh, different approaches how to uh, try to understand the unknown text. Uh, and Western text, uh, Western approach is uh, just measuring, and this is uh, symbolized by two uh, si uh, uh, old uh, scientists from the Western universities, apparently. And on the left side, you see one man, uh, apparently in uh, similar uh, dress than, than myself today. He's uh, just contemplating about it. And uh, I'm quite sure that he understands at least the same as uh, those who are measuring. But. Uh, we, we will get on uh, the whole the whole picture only if we unite those approaches. Next slide. And interestingly, there are se several books existing uh, today uh, having parallel texts in uh, like like this uh, interesting book. Uh, 
uh, with Indian, uh, Hindu, Hindi scripture on, on uh, the left side and uh, English on the right side. Next, please. And our uh, idea is to write such a text which, which will contain page by page uh, on one side the authentic Ayurvedic texts based on, uh, on old, many thousand years old traditions. And on the, on the opposite side, page by page, the same information Translate, uh, translated, interpreted in, in, into the modern bioscience. And the uh, expected outcome will be a new, more integrative understanding of the basic principles of Ayurveda in the challenging age of omics and bioinformatics because uh, my deep belief is that we, we reached now by the using the uh, IT revolution, the new level of, um, of ability to, to, to understand the, the very complex systems, which were ne was never before. We have a tool how to measure it, finally. But we still don't understand it, what should we actually measure. We, we, we need to, to create this, we need to find the new Rosetta Stone. And if we, if we will proceed, uh, succeed in this, then we will get a, a new concept based on, uh, on this uh, understandable knowledge of old uh, Ayurvedic teachings. And finally, we can uh, we'll be able also to integrate and, and to make it understandable how really live in the balance between uh, body, mind, and spirit and make it one as one whole and also prevent and treat diseases in, in op using this approach. Thank you for your attention, please. Namaste. Thank you very much, sir. We would like to congratulate the very idea, the very basic noble vision behind having a text like this. And uh, we are pleased to know that the, in the coming days, we will be working together, both the universities, uh, the Latvian University and Dev Sanskriti University, to work on such a text which can actually bring together the contemporary style of medicine. I am privileged that today we have Dr. Suresh Barnwalji with us, who is actually heading the yoga department, who looks into the contemporary system of medicine over here. In the afternoon session, we will be going through some of the experiences and knowing that uh, today we will have a post-lunch session which will talk about alternative system of therapies especially for our guests. And tomorrow we'll undergo those experiences. So we'll have nine such therapies showcased today afternoon to you, which were just shared by Professor Valdis Piragisji. And uh, the biomedicine part of the Western, of course, uh, we will look forward to uh, the experts that uh, they bring that knowledge and we amalgamate it and create. In fact, the translation done by Parampuji Gurudev of the scriptures can also come handy. Uh, the Vedas, he had, uh, the Shrutis he had translated can help us create a founding stone for this textbook. Once again, a big round of applause for Professor Valdis Piragis, who came forward with such a novel idea. Now moving on next, it's time to summarize and conclude the session. <coughs> for this, I would like to invite Vice Chancellor Dev Sanskriti Vishwavidyale, respected Sharad Parthi sir to please come on dais. Put your hands together to welcome sir. Friends, I am going to summarize it mostly in Hindi and patches of English. It's for the benefit of uh, my students here.
that whatever has been conspired and decided, what, are, what is the crux of the thing? Kartsan ji, Atmiya Kartsan ji ne, jo apne vichar rakhe, iske andar inno ne ye dekha, ki hume, ye jo business ke andar, how to incorporate spiritual outlook in the business approaches and your businesses. It's a practical part of it and he is dealing in it. Practical kar rahe hai wo. और बड़े बिजनेस हाउसेस के जो बिजनेस मैग्नेट्स हैं, इनके दिमाग में इस तरह के विचार कैसे डाले जा सकते हैं कि स्पिरिचुअलिटी को इंट्रोड्यूस करने से उनके बिजनेस में वृद्धि ही होगी। इस प्रयास को he has been trying and he has been very successfully found out the formula also that he can attract the business leaders for the new concept of putting spirituality in the attempt of their businesses and the benefits that they can they are going to reap out of this new approach unhone vishesh kar diya hai there are two things heart and mind manushya ki bhavna aur manushya ki buddhi these are two different things see your uh, uh, mind says something and uh, your feelings are different so how to incorporate, how to combine the dis total decision of these, these two, jiska combination karna, ad, aapke bhavna ka, aur aapke buddhi ka, agar aap combined roop de sake, if you could merge them into one, that he says is a scientific approach. Yeh sahi, aur a saiddhantik hamara uh, approach hona chahiye, aur unko is tarah se kaam karna chahiye. Hum agar kisi mulyo ko, अंगीकार कर लेते हैं हमारी पहचान अपने मूल्यों से होती है। We are known by the values that we accept and basically what he says the human values are absent in all the attempts. If it could be incorporated in every attempt जो भी हम करते हैं उसके अंदर मानवीय मूल्यों को अगर हम सम्मिलित कर सके हमारा उद्देश्य अगर उनके हित में हो सके तो हो सकता है कि बिजनेस हाउसेस में जो परिणति होगी वो उनके लिए उनके देश के लिए, उनके समाज के लिए और उनके राष्ट्र के लिए ज़्यादा फायदेमंद होगी। उन्होंने कहा कि एक बड़े मैग्नेट की तरह से हमको करना पड़ेगा, जिन आवश्यकताओं को हमको एकत्रित करना है, उनको एकत्रित करने के लिए we have to be we have to be a magnet sort of thing so that we can attract these people, हम इन लोगों को आकर्षित कर सके और इनके सामने अपनी भूमि और प्रतिपादन के रूप में क्यों कि वो इसमें काम कर रहे हैं, he has been practicing in it, he has been doing it, so it was not only a lecture, it was his presentation of whatever his experiences are. We thank you, doctor, for that. दूसरा था, I'm sorry, मैं इन लोगों के नाम बहुत अच्छी तरह से प्रोनंस नहीं कर सकता, I'm sorry for this. The second speaker was a doctor from Latvia. He has been practicing in modern, modern medicine. But he feels the lim there are limitations. This is a lot of limitations. Our allopathy, our body, our medicines, there are limitations for this. If you have to go out of these limitations, then you have to go out of the body system. Ayurveda and other uh, systems of the treatment of human beings are very uh, uh, are very effective. It's the other effect of the we have been practicing this type of uh, medicine, combinations of medicine. Ultimately, what is required? The patient wants to be get cured. He is not interested what type of pill you are going to give him. Whether it is Ayurvedic or whether it is uh, homeopathic or whether it is uh, allopathic or whether it is uh, treatment by healing it. Usko to sahi hona hai. Ultimately, the patient should be cured and if with those aims, we have to treat mind, body, and spirit. Hamara sharir, hamara man, or hamari chetana. Inko agar ham samhal sake, joki ham yaha pe practice kare. I am very happy to tell you, doctor, that we have been practicing. We are trying to train our students in this part of the treatment of the human beings. And uh, whenever you go into the details of it, and fortunately we have signed MOU with uh, your university, it will be beneficial to us as well as. Certain views will be helpful, helpful to you also. You know, जो एक स्वास्थ्य के लिए पिरामिड की कल्पना की है बहुत ही अच्छी है. It's always the construction of any solid structure. 
if it is in the form of pyramid. Because I'm an engineer architect and have been practicing as an architect, I know the stability of a structure where the foundation is larger than the superstructure, it will remain for a longer time. And he has designed a pyramid for health. स्वास्थ्य के लिए पिरामिड की जो कल्पना है बहुत ही अच्छी है अगर इस तरह का पिरामिड हम डेवलप कर सके तो आपका स्वास्थ्य बहुत स्थायी हो सकता है और इसीलिए इन्होंने एक नई कल्पना की है दैट ही इज़ कमिंग ए कमिंग अप विथ अ न्यू टेक्स्ट बुक विथ आयुर्वेद एंड अदर लैंग्वेजेस एक्सप्लेन एवरी सो दैट इट गिवज डिफरेंट व्यूज ऑन द सेम मे बी सेम डिसऑर्डर ऑफ body mind and spirit could be treated by any combination ultimately our aim should be the patient should be cured ek kahani kahi jati hai ki bahut bade bade surgeons they came together to operate a patient the operation went on for about 7 8 hours and all experts were there and what has happened once the operation was over this main surgeon come, came out of the ot and uh, he was asked what is the position he said i am very happy to tell you that our operation is successful but very bad our patient is dead what we want a patient should be cured what your pathy or what your treatment we give and that is the purpose of it we thank you doctor for this new view adarsh kranti ki baat hum log karte hain he is also saying with this new textbook there could be a revolution in the concept of medicine and that is what is Uh, wanted today initially dr chinmay ji gave two stories and he very effectively uh, 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 cleared the views regarding to be clear is in this thing in this uh, connection i wanted to tell you a very small uh, uh, incidents or maybe a small story you can call it there are sciences and there are practicals as you know music you can do phd in music you know all the notes you know all the ragas you know all the details you can immediately point out a mistake of a singer but you yourself cannot sing if you cannot sing yourself if you cannot do that thing yourself you have all the theoretical knowledge but it can't be put into practice only knowledge is insufficient knowledge as well as experience and putting it into the practice is very very important and probably that is the purpose of this conference agar hamara adhyatma अगर हमारा ज्ञान और विज्ञान इसका कॉम्बिनेशन कर सके तो जो प्रज्ञान निर्माण होगा द न्यू डेमिशंस विल कम आउट एंड दैट इज व्हाट इज द पर्पस ऑफ दिस योग सो दैट वी कैन जॉइन एवरी एवरीबडी टुगेदर टू गेट दिस रिजल्ट आई थैंक यू फॉर दिस थिंग थैंक यू